Welcome to Loose Change, the show that asks the question, why? Why do we live in this place? Why, why, why do we do this? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. I'm Jim Evans. Thanks for joining us. We have a very special show for you. A great guest. Hang around. We'll be doing that shortly. First, what's been going on? The weather. The cold. Again, we'll, we'll get through it, but man, we have to maneuver through this. And uh, it, it was so cold that there's a price freeze at five below. <laughs> but with the windshield, we even got down to minus 30. The same as our ratings for this show, right, Greg? <laughs> Some would say. Speaking of ratings, how about the Super Bowl? People still talking about that game. Tremendous game, and of course, New England wins it at the very end over Seattle. Malcolm Butler with that big interception right at the goal line. Tom Brady's the MVP, and he wins a truck for, for doing so. And he ended up giving that truck to Butler, the young player who saved the game. And Butler said, the truck drove pretty good, but the tires were low. <laughs> the Super Bowl probably now the ultimate, the ultimate party, isn't it? I think that's safe to say. And there's always a breakdown of the food consumption. A couple of the things, food consumed 50 million pizzas and 110 million wings. And that's still it. Honey Boo Boo's house. <laughs> hey, uh, how about Bruce Jenner? What's going on with him, huh? He recently split up with Chris Kardashian and then uh, got in a car accident and kind of going through some, some changes. But it, apparently he has a new show lined up. He will star in the new reality show, Divorced Housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> and uh, Hugh Hefner and his wife, Crystal Harris, recently celebrated two years of marriage. And again, you know, he's like 84, she's 24. But apparently it's working for them and they still seem to be happy. They were recently seen again making out in the backseat of his hover round. <laughs> hey, Dan Rivers joins us next right here on the set of Loose Chain. Day one, we'll be right back. Turn your whole home on to high-definition programming. With Armstrong's HD Digital Adapter, it's easier and more affordable than ever. The HD TV in the kitchen finally get high-definition picture and sound. The HD TV in the family room add all your favorite high-def channels at a price you can afford. Our HD DA now features an on-screen guide. To order your HD Digital Adapters, visit armstrongonewire.com slash turn it on. Armstrong, one wire, infinite possibilities. Welcome back to Loose Change. I'm Jim Evans, joined by a gentleman, very familiar uh, face, and of course, even more familiar voice. He is the local radio great, Dan Rivers. Dan, thanks for being with us. Radio great, thank you. That's nice of you to say, Jim. Glad. Thank you for asking me. Oh, without, yeah. uh, without a doubt. It's our pleasure. You've got the great shirt on there, the you got, the, shirt got that logo there. there. Yeah, you know, right uh, a lot of people know that you're not originally from the area. What we like to do at the beginning of the program is just give us a little background, where you're from and uh, how you got to where, yeah. where, where you're at. Well, I get used to doing the 25 words or less. Yeah. And, um, I was a city slicker in a town of 2,100. And nice. I had a cornfield out back of my house. The town was Columbus Grove, Ohio. Yeah. And about uh, 8 miles from Ottawa, about 12 miles from Lima. Finley's 24 miles away, Flag City. But um, we, were, we lived in town. Uh, my mother and father had farming backgrounds, but uh, he worked at a factory and uh, my mom worked at a dry cleaners. She liked to say that she was in every man's pants in town. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's, a good yeah, one. <laughs> that's your line, huh? <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I grew up there um, and, you know, always interested in radio from the time that I can remember when my dad gave, my, gave me a true tone radio and I used to listen to the Fort Wayne Comets hockey game oh, on, wow. on, um, on radio and became very enamored by WOWO in Fort Wayne. Didn't do much with it in high school, except interview people with bop, bop mm -hmm. bottles and stuff like this. But my family was in construction and uh, I started working with my uncle when I was 15 years of age. Uh, learned carpentry from 15 to 20 and then I saw the military coming mm -hmm. and um, was probably going to be drafted. But since I had some skills as a carpenter, I was able to go to the CBs, and the CBs were looking for builders, they were looking for plumbers and heavy equipment operators, and I happened to be a builder um, with some skill. I wasn't a journeyman carpenter, um, 
we were a non-union organization, and my brother is now a union carpenter. We, it's still in the family, and um, he, he works in Lima, Ohio, but uh, worked on building homes, and uh, we kind of learned the trade, and then um, went to Vietnam twice. Um, first thing we, we got into the Gulfport, Mississippi area, they said, well, boys, welcome. You're going to go to Vietnam twice. Holy cow. And uh, they said, you signed the contract, and you're going to go. And uh, we, you just kind of just... You really didn't, life just kind of unfolded before you. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of planning. And you got on a plane and you flew 20,000 miles. And you did your eight months in Vietnam. Went back and uh, rebuilt your battalion and went back to training for six months in the States. And then they sent you back. Um, first time I was in Vietnam, we built an incredible uh, build a bridge the size of the Market Street Bridge. Oh, oh and um, the bridge had some notoriety. Um, it's called The Bridge at Dong Ha, the subject of a book and an Ali North War story. And uh, long after I had left, we built that in uh, 69 and 70. And after I had left in 1972, the North Vietnamese were coming down to move their heavy equipment into South Vietnam. And uh, a guy named Lieutenant Greider uh, wrote about the fact that they went hand over hand over that bridge, put C4 on there, and they blew that bridge before the North Vietnamese could come. So all my handiwork is gone. Man. It's gone. But uh, so um, anyway, it, let me know if I'm going too far here. Oh, you're, you're rolling pretty good. Yeah. So this is interesting. So uh, after so. Vietnam, um, the second time I went back over, we went near Cambodia and we built um, housing for the uh, South Vietnamese Army. And we were finished with that, got back and uh, got out. And as soon as I got out, um, went to work for went to work in a factory for four days, and I go. This is a bad idea. My uncle said, "Why are you working in a factory? Why don't you come back to work for me in the construction business?" So, I went back there temporarily before um, I followed my dream, which was to go to broadcasting school. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people probably did back then. There was a school called Career Academy in Columbus, and they made broadcasters very quickly. And uh, usually a four month program. I got a job after two months wow. in Delaware. And yeah. um, they had a satellite radio station, and it wasn't too long before I was in the big time, and I was playing bingo on the radio. <laughs> they called it the hey. Mar they called it the Marysville Merry Go Round. <laughs> hey man! <laughs> in fact, uh, you're broadcasting, and the phone would actually ring, and people would go B twenty three check, B twenty seven check, and uh, that's a good bingo. That's a neat people, show. People would come down to the station and pick up their wine rack or whatever we're giving them, <laughs> and uh, that was my first incursion into broadcasting. Had some success in doing sales, and the general manager there had said, "Hey, you know, you'd be a great sales rep out there." Mm -hmm. but that wasn't where my heart was, although I've done some yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted I to be—I yeah. wanted to be behind the microphone and uh, went on to do some play-by-play, -play like you have done. Mm -hmm. Kind of funny being thrown into that play-by-play, -play, never being a um, a, a first-string athlete. You know, didn't know mm -hmm. that much about foot. I played some football, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, you're now thrown into play-by-play -play football and basketball, and you learn very quickly. But uh, it goes on and on and on from there. I mean, I think I moved 13 times. I was in wow. uh, 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 Delaware and Marysville and Coshocton and Toledo and eventually WCAR in Detroit. Um, four days in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. That was a mistake. A guy named Jim Martin called me and said, hey, there's jobs here in Youngstown. Mike Joseph is hiring, putting on a rock station. Can you come back here and do you have a tape? Sent that tape back here and um, first thing you know, I'm in Youngstown. And uh, playing rock and roll in Youngstown. That's how I got to Youngstown. Yeah. Kind of a circuitous turn there, huh? A little more than, uh, a little more than uh, I had, uh, had thought yeah. previously, but uh, um, what was it about radio that intrigued you? Boy, I just, I just, just everything. I mean, I, I've always preferred it over any other medium simply because you can multitask. Yes. And I don't think we thought about multitasking back then, but um, my brother and I have always been tinkerers, you know, we like to tinker in the garage and do other things and, and it was always a part of listening to sports or listening to a talk show yeah, yeah. or back in, back in the day it was listening to, you know, to uh, classic rock music, which now I've become a big country music fan, <laughs> so I've kind of left this classic rock, but I, I've, I've always liked the audio medium, I just always thought it was so versatile and of course, you know, being able to tell stories and sometimes it's great and you, you know that. You know, when you really do great radio, it can be intriguing and you're sitting in your driveway sure, yeah. and you're listening to those moments here where you just want to hear that, that fantastic story. There's not enough of those, though. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Not enough of them anymore. Were there people that you kind of looked up to or maybe learned from or emulated uh, yeah, uh, I as did. you were coming up? Yeah, and um, John Cigna 
and yeah. uh, he uh, later went on to fame at um, or KDKA, KDKA. In, uh, in Pittsburgh. And I grew up listening to John Cigna on WOWO in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Wow. And um, there were other people like uh, Bob Seavers who used to broadcast the Fort Wayne Comets hockey. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, Dan Gonder and I went to a Cleveland game and there was Bob Seaver. He was still broadcasting Fort Wayne Comet hockey as, as early as you know five or 10 years ago. And uh, they had a tremendous radio station there with that 50,000 watt blowtorch and they were heard all over the Midwest and you know even part of the East Coast. So that radio station really gave me it, my, my love for radio. You know, as you had the experience and I did as well, when you start out in that, that smaller market, smaller type station, you're kind of in that position where you have to be a master of all trades and you have to do a lot of different things, but that's a great experience coming up, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is, and uh, you don't make much money. And uh, I remember working at WTNS in Coshocton, Ohio, and, um, you know, you're, like I said, you know, you're doing the morning show and you're doing play-by-play -play basketball, play-by-play -play football, and you're not very good at any of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the first thing you realize that uh, you're trying to be somebody else because you've heard all these other announcers out there, and you're trying to emulate them, mm -hmm. which is an okay way to go, but eventually you have to find where your own voice is. And uh, you learn to do a lot of different things, and there's a lot of facets to it. In fact, I still enjoy learning the business right now. Sure. As, as you know, yeah. I mean, you know, going out and taking videos and posting them on the website and doing podcasting. And I think, um, you know, radio has changed so much that um, everybody could be a radio star if you have talent. I mean... You know, the, the tall towers are kind of a thing of the past, aren't they? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you can be a radio star just by uh, doing a podcast. Uh, example, Adam Carella. How many listeners does he yeah. have just doing podcasts? Right. Has it, has it changed for the better? Um, Maybe in some I, ways. I, I don't know. That's, um, I, certainly, I certainly hate to see the, all the loss of labor, yeah. all the loss of jobs, and all the loss of talent. And uh, it was really tough when we lost another talk show on our station, in my opinion, because I thought that that's one thing that was so important, the local talk. And there, the one thing that I have, the byword I've always lived by is a good talk is good talk. Um, you know, if you have something national that is better than local, then that's probably what should go on. But in some cases, that's not always true. And, you know, we have a lot of characters here um, in the Youngstown area. And has it changed for the better? I'd probably say no at this point, the, the short answer. Well, when you came to Youngstown, obviously it was a different dynamic. You were you were an on-air DJ, if, if right. I'm not mistaken, on the music side, um, and that was predominantly AM driven at, at that time, yeah. wasn't it? Talk we're about to, that. We're trying, we're trying to do a rock and roll format on 1390, and um, we we were not successful because uh, you know the audience was getting smaller and most of it was moving to FM, but uh, we tried very hard, and. Uh, I remember getting that job over WFMJ, and what a gig. Um, uh, come in in the morning, punch the time clock, uh, grab, grab a Cleveland Plain Dealer, and go down to the Ohio Pick Hotel and have a coffee and a donut, come back and do three hours on the air, and uh, then go to lunch. <laughs> 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 then come back about 3.30 and do another a TV show. I did a TV show back then. But uh, that, that, was, that was a pretty good gig, and that's back when you, you didn't do a lot of multitasking. Yeah. In fact, you weren't allowed to. I mean, you've worked in union situations, and uh, you know it's pretty much hands-off. Yeah. What was the TV show? Teleview. And uh, it's fu funny how people always seem to remember that show because there were cartoons right before it or after it, one of the two. And they put that on there. And uh, it was just, it was kind of one of those shows that we interviewed anybody that came in, kind of like yours. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> um, did you like being the, the music DJ? Yeah, I, I think I did. Um, it, it was fun until I discovered chalk. And uh, now I couldn't, ima I couldn't imagine myself going back and playing music, mm -hmm. unless it was country music. I, would, I, I really, it's kind of funny. I got a you know, funny story. Um, back when I was in construction, uh, there was a radio station in Bowling Green, Ohio, that played classic country. Back then, it would have been just regular yeah, country. Right, yeah, yeah. And this one guy I worked with, he would have the control of the radio, and he'd put that on all day. And I had to grow up listening to uh, Buck Owens and uh, uh, Gene Autry and all of these country people. And i go, good Lord, that's not cool at all. I want to listen to Motown. I want to listen to rock and roll. And uh, now I find myself a few years later, I'm going to see, uh, you know, uh, 
Patsy Cline if I could, you know, but I just went to see Loretta Lynn. I went to see, uh, I love Janie Johnson. I love all of the, the country music. Sure. It really speaks to my heart. And a lot of it probably has to do with the background that I grew up with, you know, listening to that music back then. Um, but I do enjoy listening to the music. But um, I can't imagine just sitting there and playing it because, as you say, I, I have a lot to say. <laughs> it seems <laughs> like it. I, I love to talk. Well, hopefully you have a lot more to say because we're going to do a break here. We're going to come back. Dan Rivers here on Loose Change. We'll be right back. Stick around. Turn your whole home on to high-definition programming. With Armstrong's HD Digital Adapter, it's easier and more affordable than ever. The HD TV in the kitchen finally get high-definition picture and sound. The HD TV in the family room add all your favorite high-def channels at a price you can afford. Our HD DA now features an on-screen guide. To order your HD Digital Adapters, visit armstrongonewire.com slash turn it on. Armstrong, one wire, infinite possibilities. Welcome back to Loose Change. I'm Tim Evans with Dan Rivers. And uh, Dan, before we get back in radio, I'm still intrigued by the fact that you were in Vietnam. Um, and I know you talked about what you did over there. But really, what was that experience like being there? You know, it's funny that you really didn't think about it then. You just thought you had to do it. And uh, I think everybody agonizes over what they're going to do right now. And I just kind of thought that everybody did it. And I wasn't understanding how some people got out of not doing it. And it was one of those things where my mother and father were not that politically savvy. And uh, there were five kids in the house. And, uh, you know, your draft number is coming up. And uh, a lot of people just went to the military. Um, I thought I'd rather control my destiny. And when I found out I had a chance to, you know, be a carpenter in Vietnam, mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe that's the best way to go. Um, you know, we were, we were in the CBs, and uh, yeah. I'm kind of proud of that because it's, a different, right. it's different than just uh, most people don't know what it is, but it's, it's a part of the Navy, it's, and uh, we uh, are right alongside the Marines. We're okay. building a lot of uh, bases for them. We built fire bases for them. Mm -hmm. um, when I was uh, first in Vietnam, here I am. 20 years of age and I'm running a batch plant. We have full cement mixers over there. We're mixing concrete. We're pouring huge slabs, doing big time construction. We have civil engineers. And um, my it was just kind of an extension of my career. We worked six and a half days in Vietnam and we had a half a day off on Sunday. And usually Sunday afternoon ended up that uh, one of the chiefs would bring out 10 pounds of potatoes and we would boil water and put a bunch of salt in it and put the potatoes in the water and the salt would boil through that and we would sit there and eat the potatoes like apples oh, wow. and drink beer. And um, nice. drinking beer was a big part of Vietnam. And there was a lot of marijuana in Vietnam too. Yeah. And you know, yeah. a lot of people, and uh, people asked me about that on the air today and they said, you know, what about all that marijuana? Does it make people lazy? And I said, yeah, I think it does. I think it really, mm -hmm. it does take away a lot of their motivation, but back with us again, doesn't it? I guess, you know, you had not gotten into broadcasting yet, but w were there opportunities to do that over in Vietnam? I know Robin Williams did that one. Yeah, movie see, I, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't, even, I, didn't, I didn't know what it was about. I never, I, I didn't really know much about it until I, miss, I, I visited a black radio station in Mississippi. I was stationed in Mississippi, and a guy named Tony the Tiger took me in and allowed me to sit on his radio show where he's spinning the discs and uh, showed me what radio was all about mm -hmm. and how it actually worked. So that was kind of my, well, you're bringing back a lot of memories here that I'm able to retrieve here. Um, but just learning how the broadcasting industry worked, and I must thank um, Vietnam and the military for allowing me to have the GI Bill because there is, I don't see myself ever being able to go to college had I not had the GI Bill. Sure. And I came to that pretty late too because, uh, you know, I'd been out of um, Vietnam since 1970 and working in broadcasting and I had an opportunity to go to Youngstown State mm -hmm. and the GI Bill paid for all of it. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those guys where I go, I'm going to take a couple <laughs> classes. Well, you teach. Yeah. Not at Young Stiles. You probably have those people. They're going to take a couple classes. Yeah. Next thing you know, you get 100 hours. Next thing you got 150 hours, and you go, my advisor, I remember Russ, I said, you know, Russ, I could graduate. <laughs> he said, yeah, you could graduate. Yeah. And um, that was a very proud moment of uh, being able to graduate because I really wasn't a very good student in, in, uh, in high school. I mean, I wasn't an idiot, but uh, didn't take it, didn't well, take it very seriously at all. Yeah. People and, do that. And uh, fought my way through it, working working part time or working full time and mm -hmm. going to school, and uh, got through Youngstown State. So I have a huge love for Youngstown State and uh, a huge love for this area. Yeah, 
we'll get to that uh, little uh, down the road here. But uh, when you came to Youngstown, uh, you bounced around a lot. What, what was Youngstown like for you at, at that time when, when you arrived here and settled in and started to work? Well, I lived in Austin Town and um, you know, became familiar with, with the town. And pretty much the only thing I knew was uh, you know, going down to um, you know, WFMJ and doing a little TV, a little radio. And then I started school pretty quickly after that. I do remember walking through the city, and uh, there were quite a few restaurants in the yeah. city at that time, mm -hmm. and it was pretty vibrant um, in the 1970s, places like Lums and uh, the Learner's Shop and uh, all of these places sure. that, down there that, uh, and uh, the theaters. Was, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Italian restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, boy, you see it slowly deteriorating. But um, I think my career really started off when I got a call from Pete Gabriel, and Pete Gabriel said, uh, Hey, hey, Tiger! <laughs> I always like to come over to WKBN. Yeah. And when I came over, when I went over to WKBN, uh, then I really started learning the broadcasting because uh, you know the Williamsons were great broadcasters. Yes, yes and, they uh, were. And uh, gave me a lot of education. And the one thing about the Williamsons, um, they allowed you to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. If you if you want to if you want to excel at something, you can do that. Yeah. That was a, that was a special place to work too, wasn't it? Oh yeah, all that Art Deco over there and. Uh, Role in radio and the promotions we were involved with, and just a tremendous um, broadcasting group. And uh, I appreciate everything I've learned over there, and uh, I appreciate uh, this valley, to tell you the truth. Sure. Because, you know, my mother and father used to come over here from uh, Columbus Grove, Ohio, and they would stay over here, and they, my mom used to say, I love coming to Youngstown. There's just so much to do. <laughs> when, uh, when you went to KBN, that was still a music format, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we were still yeah. doing that at, at that time, and uh, we had Rich Morgan on previously. And oh, did he, he had done Rich that? And yeah. uh, of course, uh, um, that yeah. was in its waning days too. Although we tried to make it make the best of it, but um, it wasn't long before they hired a guy named Steve Hook, and then they uh, had Tony Rose come in, and they had Dan Ryan. And when Dan Ryan came in, that was the cornerstone mm -hmm. uh, of the of the broadcasting um, business. I mean, that really saved um, that that radio station. Mm -hmm. Um, just to take a half step back, you had that TV experience. At that point, did you ever think about pursuing TV, or was it radio all the way? Yeah, I, I don't know if I, I never really had an opportunity. I remember one guy told me, well, you know, um, I didn't have a college education. Then uh, I said, what about me being on television? He said, well, you're not a journalist, and kind of okay. discouraged me from doing that. Okay. Um, I think television is um, a lot different because you have to – you guys have to worry about what you look like all the time, right? <laughs> well, that, not that, always. So. That, 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 that's, that's a big part of it, right? Part of it? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure it is. Yeah. So. But uh, uh, no, I, I never really, um, although I think television is a good medium also, but um, radio uh, just was in my blood. Sure. What makes a good radio broadcaster? I think a lot of natural ability. You know, I, I just think you have to have, um, there has to be something out there because I went to school with people that were trying to become broadcasters and they really didn't have that natural, well, you have to start with something. You had to have some God-given talent. And uh, you don't have to have a great voice, you just have to be a natural person and, and have a regular voice. Um, people have told me I'm blessed with a good voice. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, uh, you know, yeah. But uh, at one time I was trying to be somebody else and, and use a different voice. The guy in Detroit, Jerry Clifton, I went in to get a job at WDRQ, and he said, count for me. And he said, well, when you learn to become yourself, he said, we may have a job for you. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I wasn't myself. I was putting on something else. But I'll tell you what will make you a good, uh, give you a good self-examination is being on the radio. As you well know, when you're talking to people on the phones, it's hard to be somebody else. Yeah. Right? That's you're you're good, pretty much yourself. Stick, yeah. yeah. And people say, be yourself. That's a tough one. That's a tough thing to do, though, isn't it? To be yourself. At times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got to be yourself. And then sometimes... Um, Self is maybe a little bit too boring. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, so you, you, well. you, you so need to step it up a little bit. That can happen as well. Uh, and you have been great at production, uh, that aspect of it. Yeah. You like doing that yeah. still? Yeah, in fact, I, I really fell in love with that. And of course, I didn't really pursue that as much as, um, you know, as I could have because I became one of those jacks of all trades doing a lot of different things. But I still love getting in the production room and, um, you know, putting together a good promo or a good commercial. Sure. As yeah. you well do, too. Well, you're still doing that for sure. And, yeah. uh, and, and you know, obviously you've had some, you know, experience and, and the opportunity to be uh, somewhat on the, on the program manager side. And yeah. uh, what are the challenges with, with doing that? Uh, getting people to read your email. 
<laughs> I guess that, that's as good as answers any. Yeah. No, I, sometimes I always think about that and I think, geez, you're not reading my email. I took the time to write it. Please read my email. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think it's hard to be an on air talent and also be a program director. And I take that, it's nice because you're in it, but again, you have to judge other people and you're judging them by your standards. And um, I've learned that there's a lot of different ways to do things. You know, Ron Verb has a way of doing things, and I have a way of doing things. Yeah. And who's to say either way is right? Right. And, great, uh, great and I think you have to you have to give people a lot of room to to be themselves. Sure. How long have you been doing the talk show thing now? Um, I keep saying ten years. It could be that long. Um, the day that you know when Dan Ryan was ill, um, I was also I was filling in for him, and then he unexpectedly passed mm -hmm. on. And I, I think it's been about ten years right now since I've seriously been doing that. Um, I always aspired to do that, but I didn't really, really? think I, I didn't think I had the confidence. I didn't have the confidence to do it. I didn't really think I could do it because, as you well know, when you're doing the talk show, it's you. I, I'm sitting around some of my friends on nights, and they'll say, "Boy, you got to do a show tomorrow. What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I said, um, you know, I've got a lot of support. I said, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of preparation that I have. Um, uh, I've got a producer, and uh, I've got callers. It'll all unfold. And then you become confident in doing that type of thing. But a lot of people that." frightened to death to think that, you you know, it's just you. You don't have any records to play. We only have a couple moments left, unfortunately, but what makes a good talk show host, radio talk show host? I think a, a good talk show host is someone that can get the best out of your limited, out, out of your callers. You know, if, if, if you're, like, we're a, a call-in talk show, and if you have, I think every man has a story. And, yeah. uh, you know, you can stomp on everybody for being an idiot or, uh, you know, having uh, a lousy point of view, but... I like to hear people a little bit and see if there is something that you can work with there. And something sometimes there's a, somebody will surprise you and bring up a point that you weren't thinking about. So being able to listen, and as I've been talking all this time, you know, I'm not really that good at listening. I'm still learning. It <laughs> well, takes a you know you got to learn to listen. Yeah, and great point. you know, not always having your own agenda. And um, but uh, yeah, I would say the big thing is being able to listen and uh, kind of balancing your talk with the listening. Just a moment left now, and, and we can continue to talk, obviously, about uh, you know radio and what you're doing. But uh, I know we want to touch on YSU before we get out of here. And I know you know Youngstown State uh, is something important to you, and you're very passionate about. Yeah, you know, I was just reading the paper today, and um, you're probably seeing this a little bit later. But I see we're uh, you know they're having labor peace down there, and probably the professors are not happy because they're not getting everything. But I'm thinking under the leadership of Jim Trussell, it was quietly settled. And uh, under the leadership of uh, Jim Trussell, Bo Pelini came in here. Mm -hmm. And I see that he's out there speaking. So I'm, I'm uh, feeling good about this guy that's at the helm who probably is out working most people. And um, I got, a right. lot, got a lot going on at Youngstown State University. I only hope that people will embrace it and consider sending their students there yeah. rather than going I out think of that's going to happen. Again. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing, especially when you get your undergraduate work yeah. done at a, at a lesser price and then go to a selective school yeah. if you want to, right? Yeah. That's what I would do if I had little ones. Sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Unfortunately, Dan, we're out of time, but uh, boy, it's great to see you and have you in on the show. I appreciate thank your you, time. Jim. And uh, great Dan Rivers, you're well, on Loose Change. Thank you very much, Jim, and I, I want to uh, address the work that you do. You've done the sports show for a long time and kind of worked with me mm -hmm. on that and uh, terrific job. And, well, thank you. I love your sense of humor. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, we keep that going. All right, we'll be right back and close it out. When your product isn't as good as cable, you hire an expensive law firm. When you hire an expensive law firm, they write small print. Smaller. When people don't read the small print, they sign up for a product that is not as good as cable. When they discover that they signed up for a product that is not as good as cable, they read the small print. When they read the small print, they lose consciousness. Don't lose consciousness. Stick with Armstrong and never be surprised by the dishes small print. Armstrong. One wire. Infinite possibilities. Well, that will do it for our show. I did it again. Another Peyton Manning thing. Sorry. That's going to do it for our show. Thanks so much to Greg Roden and to the great Dan Rivers. I'm Jim Evans. We'll catch you next time right here on Loose Change.